Okay. Um, so I'll talk about uh, three things. One is how to use MATLAB to solve problems that are non-square, right? So we talked in the um, So when we talked in the, the theoretical material, if you will, in the lectures, I talked about how to solve this problem if, even if A was not square. In other words, you had more equations than unknowns or less equations than unknowns. And in MATLAB, we only talked so far about how to solve the square problem. So today I'll talk quickly. It's not hard, very easy actually, to solve non-square problems in MATLAB. Okay. Then I'll show you how to calculate norms. You know, we introduced the norms, right? Like for example, we had a vector x. We, for example, defined something called the two norm. That's where you took every component of x and squared it. And then took the square root. We called that the two norm. We also introduced the one norm, the infinity norm. We defined norms for matrices, all that stuff. So I'll show you how to calculate those things in that lab. We talked about how to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the matrix A, right? That was Tuesday. And that was yesterday, okay? So I showed you if you have a matrix A, how to find its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Are you dudes drinking out of the same orange juice thing? <laughs> That's not actually true, because I saw you drinking out of a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, um, all right. So if that if that kind of dealt with, um, I showed you how to find the eigenvalues, and then using the eigenvalues, find the eigenvectors of A. It's a you know pretty onerous procedure, especially if A is a big matrix. So I'll show you how to do that in MATLAB, and then I'll give you a little problem here at the end. All right. So we kind of know this. It's just a slight copy from a previous lecture. So. We have our set, set of linear algebraic equations, ax equals b. We focus mainly on this problem, which is where the number of equations, m, is the same as the number of n nodes, n, right? So if we look at this matrix A, the way we normally write it has m rows, each row is an equation, and n columns, each column is an unknown. So if you, if you have the same number of equations as unknowns, then we know that this problem has a solution, and the solution is unique as long as this matrix has a non-zero determinant, it's full rank, all the things we talked, it's non-singular, all, all used interchangeably. All right, we also talked about these two problems. Okay. <coughs> this is where you have more equations than unknowns. This was a little like your homework problem, right? I gave you a homework problem yesterday, and that's a problem where I think, is this, no, is this right? More equations than unknowns. Was that the problem I gave you yesterday? Mm -hmm. Okay. So first I gave you a square system, right? And then I had you eliminate one of the variables. That's right. So that made the problem non-square. and gave you more equations than unknowns. So obviously, if you have three equations and only two unknowns to satisfy them, you can't satisfy all three equations. Okay? So we talked about how you do this in it. So no solution exists in the traditional sense. I showed you how to find the least square solution of this. That's where you found satisfied the three equations as close as possible in the least square sense. And then we also had this problem. This is where you have more unknowns and equations. And there the problem is you not only have a solution, you have an infinite number of solutions. So I talked to you in class how to find something called the minimum norm solution, right? That was the, that was the x vector that satisfied these equations, which is not unique. But it is unique if you find the x vector that has the smallest norm. So in other words, you find the x vector that satisfies the equation, but also has to have the norm as small as possible. It's called the minimum norm solution. So I showed you that. Okay. And we did this all analytically on paper. So now we're going to do it all in MATLAB. And you'll, as usual, you'll find you like MATLAB a lot better. At least you should. All right, so here's the <coughs> command. It's the same command you use to solve if the problem is square. Okay. So use the lens solve. Remember, I taught you three ways to solve a set of linear algebra equations if it was square. And um, I think the three ways look like this. Um, one was. That was one way to solve it. Another way was, I think this slash went that way. You could do that. Okay. Or you could do this. Um, use this lens solve function. Okay. 
So at this point, I'm just going to talk about the Linsol function. I think you can also do this if you want. Same thing with this. Nice thing about the Linsol function is it has some options you can use. So obviously, the problem we're looking for here is we would like to solve, find the x factor that satisfies the set of equations that x equal b, even if a is not a square matrix. Okay. So if you issue the command like this, you can issue it like this if you want, or you can issue it like this. This gives you a little bit additional information in that it also, in addition to the solution x, it also returns r. Okay. So r here, if you look, is the reciprocal. So if the matrix A is square, okay, then it returns you the reciprocal of the condition number. Remember the condition number tells you if the matrix is poorly conditioned. And if, if the condition number is really big, we don't really trust the solution. So because it's the reciprocal, now we're worried about um, r being really small. R is really small. You've got to be careful what the solution is. If the problem is non-square, then r has a completely different meaning. It's actually the rank of the matrix. If it's rectangular, which means non-square. I just copied this from that lab. Okay. Um, and the other thing you can do here is that you can specify certain options that there's a lot of options more than I'm talking about here that you can customize the solution of the problem. So the way numerical methods work is that if you solve a small problem, you don't need to take any special considerations. Okay? But if the problem gets really big, and by big I mean like A might be a thousand by a thousand matrix, you know, like a thousand equations, thousand unknowns, then the problem becomes a lot more difficult to solve, and then any additional information you can provide to the solver about the nature of your problem will be useful. Okay. Like if it's a two by two system, it doesn't you don't need to protect any information. But if this was ten thousand equations and ten thousand unknowns, and if you happen to know your matrix had one of these properties, you would want to tell the solver this was true for your problem, and it would solve the problem much more efficiently. Okay, and also you'd be much more reliable. So, for example, we talked about this before, right? problems are triangular, either lower or upper triangular. You, you remember what a symmetric matrix was? That's where A equals A triangle goes. That's a symmetric matrix. And then, I think we talked about this briefly. Um, a symmetric matrix is one where So there's something called a positive definite matrix, okay? And if you if you have a cement, uh, positive definite matrix, this this thing is true. You have to go back in the notes and kind of look. We didn't really focus on it much, so it's not a core issue. But I guess what I'm really trying to impart here is if you know something about the structure of your problem, like the matrix A has certain properties, if the problem is big, it'll be very useful to tell the solver this information. Okay, if the problem is small, it won't make any difference. That's, that's the point. Okay, so here's some problems. We already solved all these problems by hand. <coughs> Um, and that they're easy to solve in MATLAB. So here's an example where we have, what is this? This is, I think I'd be smarter than this. Story. Okay, there's, this is a matrix, this is a problem where there's two unknowns and three equations, right? This, this problem has three rows, but only has two columns. So there's three equations and two unknowns. Okay, so guess what? With two unknowns, there's no way to satisfy all three equations. So what MATLAB does is, do the same thing we talked about in the note. Tries to find the least square solution of the problem. The value of x will satisfy the three equations as closely as possible. This is the same answer we got by doing it by hand. Okay. You might remember, I think it was something like, I think, don't quote me on this. I think we found the solution was something that looked like this. Right, and so I derived this in the lecture notes, and then I just I, then we went through a little example of this one in particular, and we computed the solution using this formula, and we got that answer. So MATLAB gives us the same answer. That's gratifying, I guess. Um, and so then it also says R is two, right? This is a non-square problem. It has three rows and two columns, and, and MATLAB is telling you the rank of your problem is two. Right, the rank of a non-square matrix at best is the minimum of the number of rows and columns. So if you have a three by two problem, it can't have rank bigger than two. It might be one, but it can't be bigger than two. All right, so here's the opposite case here. So in this case, we have two equations and we have three unknowns, right? Because this is a problem that has two rows and three columns. Okay. 
So the problem here is the solution is not going to be unique. Okay. Now last time we solved this problem, so we came up with a formula that looked like this. It was a little bit different for this problem. I didn't actually derive it. I just gave it to you. Um, and we came up with a solution. The solution was actually this thing over here. That was x1, that was x2, and that was x3. That was the x vector that satisfied these two equations and had the smallest norm possible. That's how we formulated the problem, right? Because you can't find a unique uh, vector x that satisfies the equations, find the vector x that satisfies the equation that's the smallest norm possible. That at least makes it unique, you see. You can't, if you have a solution that exists but it's not unique, then you'll seek to make a unique solution. Because otherwise, every time you solve it, you get a different answer, which isn't very desirable. So if you go back to the notes, you'll see we came up with this answer. Okay? So why am I jumping ahead like this? Because if you use MATLAB to solve this problem, see, there's your A matrix, right? Two equations, three unknowns, there's your B vector. You solve the problem, it gives you this. You're like, well, that distinctly doesn't look like that. Right? It's coming up with x1, x2, x3, that, and we came up with this. Um, again, it fits back to the R, shows the range of your problem is too. So why does MATLAB do this? Well, the first thing, I'll tell you in a second, but the first thing you notice, if you took the norm of this vector x here, it's this number. I just used this function, which I guess I'm about to introduce to you. Okay, so this takes the two norm of a vector and gives you this answer. If you take the two norm of our answer, both these things satisfy the equation, you get the idea. But ours is, like as promised, has a smaller norm than the one that lab gave us. Okay, so I promise you the minimum norm solution, and I don't want to disappoint you, okay. So it is smaller norm, so why did MATLAB do this? Well, MATLAB has a slightly different way of solving these problems that are non-square. So what it does is just, it just sets x3 to 0, and then you have a 2 by 2 system, right? If you remove x3 from the problem by setting it to 0, then you have a 2 by 2 system, and then it solves that 2 by 2 system to get the answer. It's a legitimate answer. It's unique also, because if you agree that x3 is going to be 0, it's just not the minimum norm. The main point I'm trying to point out here, not that you're likely to do this, but if you did this in class, and then you did this in MATLAB, you would think somebody's wrong. The answer is neither person is wrong, it's just different. Okay? That's what they say when like, people are weird, right? They're, like, they're not weird, they're just different. <laughs> so MATLAB, MATLAB is not weird, you know, it's just different than us. Okay. All right, so how do you calculate vector norms? It's quite easy. So these are the commands, right? So if you just issue the norm of x like this, you'll get the two norm of the vector x. You can calculate the p norm. You, you might recall the p norm is Instead of doing this, let's say you wanted the three norm for some reason, you would you would take everything and raise it to the third power. Actually, you have to do the absolute value and then raise it to the third power. And then you take the the, cu the cubic root instead of the square root. That's called the three norm. No one uses that, but anyway, you can do it if you want. You can specify you can read the norm any p norm you want. Okay, if you don't specify p, you get the two norm. You can also calculate the infinity norm. So, for example, this is what we did in class in the lecture. So there's a vector I, I made up. You calculate the two norm like this with that number. Same thing we got in the, the lecture. If you calculate the one norm, right, you might want that. Remember what the one norm is? That's take the absolute value of all these things and add them together. That's, yeah, that's true. Good. Okay, there it is. Ten. You right, call the infinity norm is take the absolute value of every element and see which of those gives you the highest value, and that's the absolute value of that, which is four. Okay, so the same answer as we got, no big deal. Um, you can also do the same thing with matrices, right? You want to take the norm of the matrix, you can take the one norm of the matrix, you can calculate the infinity norm of the matrix, you can calculate the Frobenius norm. This is the analog to the two norm for a vector, is the Frobenius norm. <coughs> I think we call this thing the column sum norm, we call this thing the row sum norm, and we call this the Frobenius norm. So let's say I gave you this matrix. So at this point, I'm assuming if I write this in MATLAB, you know exactly what that matrix looks like. Right? That's the matrix where the first row is that, the second row is that, and the third row is that. All right, so if you, if you want to calculate, let's say, the, easy, the thing you're probably most comfortable with based on what I told you, the Frobenius norm, what you do is you take, you take every one of these elements and square it, and then you take the square root of the sum. So it looks just like this, except you're doing it over every single element of the matrix instead of the vector. Okay, and if you do that, you'll get this number. Okay, good. Um, if you do this, I think this is the column sum norm. Let me check that. 
So, so the, to calculate this, to make to, well, to convince yourself this is correct, what you have to do is do some of the columns and find which column gives you the largest value. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it'll be the third column. Three plus six plus nine is eighteen. So the third column gives you the highest sum. That's the one norm, the column sum norm. To do the infinity norm, you sum over rows, as we talked about. And again, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure the third one is going to give you the biggest value, and that's going to be 24. OK? So obviously, the value of computing using these things increases as the problem gets large, like anything else. All right. Calculate eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So this is the command you can use. Okay, so it's the i command. So first of all, you have to give it a matrix x. Or call the matrix anything you want. It doesn't make any difference. Right? So you give it a matrix x. x would better be square. Okay? And then what it's going to do is it's going to give you a diagonal matrix D. Okay? So it has two arguments. right? This is the way functions work. You give it something, and it gives you something back. What it gives you back is a diagonal matrix D. Diagonal matrix means it only has entries on the diagonal. And those entries are the eigenvalues. And then it gives you a matrix B, and the columns of that matrix B are the eigenvectors. Okay. In the notes, we actually call that matrix B X, the modal matrix. It's the matrix where the eigenvectors are the columns. All right, so let's say you had this um, ingenious um, matrix here. Two by two problem. You issue this command, okay, without a semicolon, and it will spit this out. So first of all, look at the matrix D. It's a diagonal matrix, and those are the two eigenvalues. The first eigenvalue is 2, the second eigenvalue is minus 5. Okay. Order doesn't make any difference. One eigenvalue there, one eigenvalue there. Then the matrix X it gives you back is the matrix such that um, the columns are the eigenvectors. So that's the first eigenvector. It's the eigenvector that goes with that eigenvalue, and there's the second eigenvector that goes with that eigenvalue. I say those are weird numbers. Like why would it come back with that? Well, we learned that the eigenvectors are not are not unique, right? They're only unique up to a constant. And so, all I try to do what, over here is convince you that. So, first of all, do you know what this command does here? Not the norm part. What's in the middle there? This is the quiz thing. Yes, tell me. It's the first column. Text. Yes, first column. Right. So that's the first column. So that tells you. Please give me every element, all rows, in the first column. And this says the same thing for the second column. So that's the first eigenvector. That's this thing right here. You take the norm of that, gives you one. Okay. Do the same thing for the second eigenvector, gives you one. So in other words, what MATLAB is, because you know MATLAB is a tool, and every time you calculate this problem, you need the same answer. Right? So to make the problem unique, it gives you back eigenvectors that always have a norm of one. That's, that's why it's these weird numbers, because that, that has a normal one. So if you calculated this two norm of those two vectors by hand, you would find they're both one. Okay? Now if I look at this, my if I were to do this problem, you would find I would invariably come up with the with the following eigenvectors, which again are not unique, but they're neater. So first eigenvector would be um, well, I can see, you probably can too, that the key thing is that that thing there is twice that thing. So I would come up with that probably. It's cleaner. It does not have a normal one, of course. And the second one, you can see that um, this guy here is th minus three times that guy. So I don't know. I might come up with this. Equally legitimate. but. All right. These are two other cases that we did in the class um, analytically. So here is a matrix. And if you issue this command on this matrix, it gives you back the following. So first of all, the D matrix, it's got, you have two on the diagonals. This is the repeated eigenvalue one. Right? It's got two eigenvalues, but they're repeated. And then it gives you back um, these two eigenvectors. We, we kind of we learn, if you don't remember, that if you have repeated eigenvalues, the eigenvectors will not be linearly independent. Clearly, this eigenvector here is just this one times minus one. It's not linearly independent. 
right? There's no, there's no requirement that eigenvectors be linearly independent. It's certainly valuable for things we're going to do in the future, but if they're repeated eigenvalues, you don't get that. Okay. Now let's say, <laughs> there's a missing link in human evolution. All right. Um, the missing link is what? What is the matrix A that I've calculated the eigenvalues for right here? You see, I must have deleted it accidentally. So if you don't mind, I'll go find what it looked like. So. It was that matrix, even though I deleted it. Sorry about that. It was A equal. Minus one, minus one, one, minus one. Okay. I'll, I'll put it on the slide. I actually have to delete it. All right. So there's the matrix. And if we are to. Oh. So if you specify that matrix, which I've deleted, but you know how to do it, if it looks like I wrote it there, and then you issue this command, you get this. So this tells you that you've got two eigenvalues that are complex conjugate pair of eigenvalues. They both have real part minus one and imaginary part plus one, or one, right? I is the imaginary number, obviously. And then you get the two eigenvectors here. So this is the eigenvector that goes with this eigenvalue. And then this um, is the eigenvalue. This is the eigenvector that goes with that eigenvalue. You might wonder, how does it come up with this weird numbers here, right? Well, guess what? If you take that thing and square it, and then plus this thing and square it, okay? So in other words, if you take this eigenvector and square these two things, you'll end up getting a thing something that has a normal one, right? Because you'll square this thing and get about 0.5. In fact, you'll get exactly 0.5. And then you'll take this thing and you'll get the i will i squared will be minus one, so this will also be plus 0.5. And then you take the square root of one and you get one. So it comes up with these numbers to get a normal one. All right. So I'm not sure where I came up with this one, but anyway. So here is your here is your um, so the. Let me go start. Here is your problem. Your problem is to do the following. So we talked about this. You wrote a function, you might recall. Hopefully you have your function. You know, you're in trouble. All right. So you're supposed to form the Hilbert matrix and then solve sets of equations that look like this. The first thing you're going to do is form a Hilbert matrix using the function you wrote. Right? The idea is you wrote this function and you give the size of the matrix its square, right? So if you do three, you get the three by three Hilbert matrix there. Call that matrix A, and then solve a set of linear algebraic equations that look like that using the Hilbert matrix you generated. And to do this, you have to have a B vector. And when I tell you, just use a B vector that's one of the appropriate dimensions. So obviously, if that's the three by three Hilbert matrix, then B is a vector of three ones. If A is a 10 by 10 Hilbert matrix, then B is a vector of 10 ones, okay? So, use your function. Do them one at a time. I'd actually do it for n equal three and n equal ten. So first of all, do it for solve the problem for n equal three, and then you do it for n equal ten. And I and I don't remember for sure, but I think once you get up to n equal ten, Matt and I will start telling you that the problem is ill. Right. The point of this problem is to explore the ill conditioning. Right. I told you Hilbert matrix is famous because it's famous ill conditioned matrix. So when n is three, it'll be fine. But when n equals ten, Matt will probably give you a message that says. A is really poorly conditioned. I'm not sure you should believe your solution type thing. Okay? So that's that's the exercise. So work on that. If you have a problem, let me know. I'm gonna be up here checking my email and stuff like that. So you should be able to get out of here. This should only take you like five minutes at most. That's my theory. Alright? But so if you have any problems, let me know. If you don't have the function that does the Hilbert matrix, then you can always at least form the three by three problem and solve that because you can just do it by hand. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
polyanalysis is symmetrical matrix. Um, that you have to so go. I would go. I would go find. But let's have you find this. I'm gonna pull my screen down. Um, so go in there and type in how Blin's law. And it's been back a bunch of stuff, right? Okay, now go to the part that says options. Probably what you do is you have your A, right? You say Blin's law, A comma B, and then you'll put a comma. And then you'll probably put a symmetric in quotes. That's why I'm in quotes. I'll do it in a second, but I don't want to leave the slide up right now. Somebody astutely realized this, this problem is symmetrical. Right? Remember, a symmetrical matrix is if you look at the along the diagonal. Okay, if you look at the diagonal here. Right, or look at this one's easier to see. It's exactly the same above the diagonal as below the diagonal. That's what one's saying A equals A transpose. So that means this is by definition a symmetric matrix. Dude's obviously looking for extra credit and may easily get it. It's hard to say. Right. So th there's a command in there. If you if you want to learn how to use it, if you're you think this is too easy, which it probably is, then you could do help lens solve and then it will show you how to put in options. You know, I told you if it's symmetric, you can tell it. I don't know this is true, so don't quote me on this one. But have you tried that yet? I have. Did it work? No. Okay, well. You think that the area of the self-circuit argument with the structure array is? We'll have to play around with it. All right. Anyway, it's not an essential part of what you're doing, but it is. It is true.
Alright, so if you do this, it says it's fine. Now what if you do the same thing but you remove that? I'm thinking the off might help it deal with a bigger problem. But I don't I don't know this would be the trouble to find out.